I'd like to take a little bit of time now to talk about our current product lineup and then our future products that we have coming down the uh, down the line. Um, back in the beginning, this is what the product that it all started with. This is the Smuggler's Whiskey. Uh, as I said earlier, I'm a fifth generation moonshiner from Kentucky. This is our family recipe that goes back to 1883. Uh, so it's a moonshine recipe that uh, basically aged in a barrel and we use the, uh, a special process, a patented process on it called TerraPure, which uses low frequency acoustic energy to simulate the changing of the seasons and make a, um, a sweeter, lighter uh, bourbon whiskey. So you can take this whiskey and you can substitute it in any rum drink when you're down here in Key West and enjoying yourself uh, down at the bars. You don't have to think about it. You can say, hey, I'd like to have a rum runner. But instead of putting the, um, uh, the bad well rum in there, you can substitute a smuggler's whiskey in there instead of have a top quality whiskey. And the bartender doesn't have to think about it too much and you don't have to think about it too much. And then the, you don't get the hangover that you would get from the, the lower quality spirits. Then the second thing that we came out with was the, the Wreckers uh, Select Vodka, which uh, designed the vodka just to be a pure, straightforward spirit. Uh, we also use the TerraPure process on it, but not for aging, but for cleaning. Uh, the TerraPure process uh, that we use on the whiskey as a byproduct of that actually cleans the spirit. It reduces the congeners in the spirits uh, by 70%. So we distill it 21 times, run it through the TerraPure process, and what you end up with is just the absolute cleanest spirit you could possibly have. And that's how I wanted the vodka so that when you make a drink with the vodka, you only taste what you're mixing with it. You don't really get the, the uh, ethanol taste from the spirit itself. <clears throat> the third product that we came out with is the Temple Pence Revenge Rum. Temple Pent was a, a, a questionable character here in Key West back in the 1800s. Um, he was uh, a very, they're a very famous family here in Key West, so we, we named it after Temple Pent. Um, we're revenging his name, so to speak. Uh, same thing, we have a very pure uh, rum, but instead of just being a straightforward silver rum, uh, I run it through the TerraPure process, but then add in uncharred oak <clears throat> so that you get the tannins and the, the flavors from the, the wood itself, but it doesn't actually age the spirit. So people will initially drink it thinking it's going to taste like a Bacardi or you know some other silver rum, and then they're very pleasantly surprised when they find out that it's actually got depth of character. Uh, so we're really, really proud of that product. Um, and then one of our flagship products that we came up with a few years ago is the Death in the Afternoon Absinthe. So the Death in the Afternoon Absinthe is kind of basis, uh, is the basis for what our expansion of the company is. Uh, Key West is a Hemingway town. So uh, Hemingway's house is here. He also had a house in Havana, Cuba, and he was known to drink absinthe. Absinthe was illegal when Hemingway was drinking it. It was banned in every country in the world except for Spain. Uh, it was banned in the United States from 1912 until 2007. So I patterned this absinthe uh, along with my good friend, Alan Bishop, who is an alchemist and master distiller here in the US. And uh, we worked hand in hand on trying to perfect exactly what it was we were going for, which is a duplication of the style of absinthe that Hemingway started drinking when he was a war correspondent in France. So this is a French vert, uh, otherwise known as the Green Fairy. Uh, it is the most popular style of absinthe. <clears throat> it's called Death in the Afternoon because that's our nod to Hemingway. Uh, the Death in the Afternoon was his signature cocktail, which was absinthe and champagne. Uh, you never drink absinthe straight. That's a common uh, a mistake that people make when they drink absinthe for the first time. They'll do a shot of it. It's never drank as a shot. Uh, so you always have to, it's called a la louche. The process of diluting it is uh, it's called a la louche. And uh, Hemingway uh, would la louche his absinthe with champagne, a really high-end champagne from France. Um, Death in the Afternoon is also a book that Hemingway wrote. 
uh, about a Spanish bullfighter who, who drank absinthe. So this is the, the foundation and the basis for, for our product lines moving forward uh, when I start talking about our, our future products. Uh, but I do want to touch base real quick on how to properly drink an absinthe drink. It was invented in 1792 by a coven of witches in Switzerland as a tincture. So absinthe, if you think of it, is an is a alcohol-based medication. So just like um, in the Mary Poppins show, a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down. Tinctures were always concentrated. You would never drink them straight. You would add water and sugar to it to make it a palatable drink. So there are a lot of accoutrements that go along with drinking absinthe properly. The first major part of it is the absinthe fountain. Uh, this is a vessel that effectively just holds ice water. This entire vessel up here at the top would just be full of ice water. And then you would take a, a proper glass, which is called a pontarlier. Move this over here a little bit. Uh, this is a pontarlier glass. It's specifically not designed by the Pernod company back in the uh, 1800s for the consumption of absinthe. So you don't have to do any measurements with this type, type of a glass. There's a vessel in the bottom of the glass which holds the perfect amount of absinthe, which is 0.9 ounces. And then you have, if you were in an absinthe bar back in the 1800s, the absinthe would come to you as basically a shot in the bottom of the glass on a saucer. And these saucers are reproductions that we have as well, which this would be how much the drink cost in francs. So that you would get your drink, and then when you drank it, you would stack your saucers. And at the end of the night, that would be your bar tab because the different absinths cost different prices and uh, so on and so forth. So anyway, you would have your absinthe poured in the glass and then you sit on your saucer and then you have an absinthe spoon. There's a thousand different variations of absinthe spoon styles, different things. And this would be a personal item that someone would typically have with them and carry with them as a monogrammed or, or personal thing. You typically would use one that was in the facility. You would bring your own as something you would carry with you. So the absinthe is in the bottom of the glass. You would put the spoon on top and you would take a sugar cube and place on top of the spoon. And then you see each of the glasses have a scallop in it or some sort of a design. And that's the level that we would want to drip the water into. So then we would turn on this little valve right here until it slow drips onto the sugar cube into the glass. And that process is called a lalouche. If you're drinking a green absinthe, which is also known as the green fairy, which is our style here with the death in the afternoon, that would be called letting the green fairy out. Some you know, folklore uh, indicates that once the green fairy gets out, you know, you don't never know what's, what's gonna happen that evening. Uh, also in our product line, uh, we do have different sizes. So we do have, these are our 750 milliliter bottles, which are kind of like the, the basic um, uh, basis for the entire line. And then they do come in a, a 375 milliliter version, uh, which is, some people call them pints or and then half pints, but that no like actually no longer exists. They're in milliliters now. So this is a 375, which is half of one of these, 750, 375. And then these are called nips or airplane bottles. Um, it's the uh, 50 milliliter. So these are the little kind of souvenir bottles that we have as well. These are very popular with the tourists, uh, literally just to buy them, take them home with them, or you know, or if somebody just wants to sample one of our products, uh, this is a great way to sample, sample one of our products, as well as a good souvenir. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about our new products and the future of the company and the direction that we're going, uh, our planned expansion. Uh, Absinthe obviously is um, a division of alcohol that's uh, you know new since 2007. It was illegal before then. So there's very little competition in the marketplace. And uh, we've had such great success and such high return on investment for the actual product itself. Uh, we currently have five approved recipes with the federal government that we're going to be expanding into that line. So we'll have five Absinthe products our, ourselves under our own umbrella, under our own assets and then we'll also distribute uh, other absinthe products so that we establish ourselves as the, uh, the authority on absinthe uh, in the United States and in the markets that we, that we expand into. Uh, one of the last, um, the next products that's getting ready to come out in the Key West Trading Company line is Skippy's Mistake Tropical Gin. So it's a citrus gin made from uh, Florida citrus. It's very citrus forward. It's going to be fantastic for making with, uh, you know, tropical cocktails and those kind of a thing. 
Uh, but then our expansion from this point is to expand into New Orleans with our division, our wholesale division in New Orleans called the, the Spirits of New Orleans. And we will specialize in absent products. Um, even in Key West and in New Orleans, our company is a wholesale company. We provide the fountains. It's an entire program. We provide the fountains, the glasses, the sugar, the spoons, the staff training so that they understand the history of absinthe and how to do it properly and how, how to create cocktails from the absinthe. So our first New Orleans-based um, brand under the spirits of New Orleans is Voodoo Fairy. Voodoo Fairy is the first Levon absinthe in the United States, which is a, a lavender absinthe. That doesn't mean that the flavor is lavender. Uh, when they talk about absinthe, the three basic ingredients in absinthe are um, grand wormwood, fennel, and star anise. And those three things have to be in the absinthe and the, the strongest taste comes from the star anise, which is a kind of a licorice flavor, even though there's no licorice root actually in the product itself. So if you think along the lines of the base product is always the same, and then the difference is the colorization of it. So the colorization of the Death in the Afternoon absinthe, for example, the green one, is uh, colored with lemon balm. All of our absinths are made from all natural ingredients, all um, natural botanicals. We import all of the botanicals from France so that it's true to its original origins, which is uh, Switzerland, France, Spain. Those are kind of the regions that have the best absinths in, in Europe. So we import all of our, pro all, all of our uh, ingredients from there. Uh, so this one in particular, the, it's, the, it's a base absinthe, but then the colorization of it, the lavender colorization of it, is actually made from Indiana purple corn. So we extract the colors uh, from the Indiana purple corn, and it's a very difficult process to do. Absinthe is the most difficult spirit to make which also puts us in a unique position because we have the talent with um, Alan Bishop and Bill Hockett and some of the you know, top, top producers in the United States and alchemists uh, to create these brands and to reproduce them uh, in a manner that your, your average distiller doesn't have the, the capability to, to uh, reproduce these kind of a spirit and do it properly. Um, so then moving on from this, our uh, third iteration of absinthe uh, is called Red Devil. And the colorization of that is made with uh, hibiscus. <clears throat> uh, so hibiscus uh, is probably the only one that actually alters the flavor of the absinthe itself. It takes on more of a tea flavor, and that kind of gives us a, um, a good entry-level product for someone who doesn't like the taste of the, of the, the licorice or the, uh, the star anise. So it kind of has more of that herbal, you know, kind of a tea thing going on there. So in events and things that we've done in the past, that's been a, a great absinthe for people to try and get into and, and kind of break into it. Once they start drinking absinthe, um, you typically have a customer for life. So uh, the, the effects of the Grand Wormwood itself contains a hallucinogen called Thujone. The Thujone has been proven to be completely harmless to people. Um, it's just the, the it's a different type, type of a buzz because the Thujon counteracts the effects of the ethanol. So instead of getting drunk, you don't get drunk off of absinthe, you get a euphoria. That's why it was called the drink of artists. Artists and poets and writers, people like Edgar Allan Poe, <clears throat> and of course Hemingway, um, Van Gogh, you know, these people would drink absinthe uh, because they could still do their craft. They wouldn't be drunk. They would have a euphoria and a high, and you'd see that the colors would be vibrant and it would be different, but they could still function and still be you know, artistic in nature. So the, the Red Devil is gonna be a very exciting product for us. You know, that's gonna really, really boost the, the branding. And then past that, we have what's called a Blanche. Uh, a Blanche has no colorization to it at all. The original Swiss version had no color. And then when they migrated uh, absent to France, France uh, would take local botanicals and start putting it in. And that's where the colors came from and the different medicinal herbs and things that they would add to the absinthe um, after it migrated from France. Uh, from Switzerland, sorry. Let me try that again. So once it migrated from Switzerland to France, that's when they started adding all of the colors to the uh, absinthe itself. 
The colorization is just added botanical, so it doesn't really change the flavor profile except for the hibiscus version of it. Uh, it's more additional medicinal herbs, uh, it's colorization, it's uh, different uh, ways that the, the louche itself happens, uh, the colors change and, and create uh, these different, different moods and different um, chemical compositions. So our Blanche absinthe that's coming out is a true Swiss Blanche, um, which had no color to it at all and it kind of just louches a milky white almost, um, and is a true, a true Swiss version of it. And then our fifth one that's gonna be coming out, we're actually using uh, pea flower. So pea flower is a very unique compound and it's really gonna give us a unique twist and it'll be the first absinthe in the United States to use a pea flower. So we have a couple of absinths that are coming out that are first ever in the United States. Um, and that's gonna, I think, put us on the map when we're operating in New Orleans, which is the number one city in the United States for absence, um, we'll have an entire program put together where we provide the absence, we provide the equipment, we provide the training, and then we're on site every day, you know, uh, available to train staff or anything that's necessary in uh, the Big Easy. Hello, I'm Colonel J.D. Martin, proprietor of the Key West Trading Company. I'm a Kentucky Colonel, fifth generation. I'm also a fifth generation moonshiner from the Commonwealth of Kentucky and a certified master of whiskeys. I would like to talk about how the company started and how I got my start um, as a fifth generation moonshiner in Kentucky. Uh, I grew up in the spirits industry uh, on the illegal side. So in five generations uh, dating back to 1883, uh, I am the first one in the family to be legal. So um, to some in the family, that's a good thing. To some, it's not such a good thing as we were you know, very anti-government. Uh, but nonetheless, now I'm completely legal and formed the Key West Trading Company, which is the purveyors of fine whiskeys and spirits. Uh, the flagship product, or kind of the, the initial uh, launch of the company, was the idea was to bring my family heritage of bourbon whiskey uh, and of course the heritage of Kentucky in general to the southernmost city in the United States to Key West uh, which is a very difficult thing to do uh, because uh, it's a tropical climate it's an island and typically you wouldn't think of um, bourbon whiskey as something that you would consume on an island so uh, I spent a lot of time trying to come up with a creative uh, way to make this happen and what I uh, came up with is our first product which was the, the smugglers whiskey which is the first bourbon whiskey designed specifically for island consumption. How do you accomplish that? Uh, I found a process called TerraPure, which is a patented process that uses low frequency acoustic energy to simulate the changing of the seasons and fast age the whiskey. Therefore, the bourbon doesn't sit in the cask as long, so it doesn't pick up all of those heavy carcinogen tastes and congeners. Uh, that, that give it that you know heavy heavy taste, which wouldn't be conducive to tropical climate and tropical consumption. Um, we aged the whiskey in a barrel for one year and one day to qualify as a bourbon, and then we transfer to this process that we license uh, from Green River Distillery in my hometown of Kentucky in Owensboro, Kentucky, and it ages the whiskey three more years in ten hours. So we end up with a four-year equivalently aged product in just one year and two days. Uh, therefore, making the whiskey lighter, allowing more of the corn flavor to come out in it. Remember, this is a moonshine that's just been aged. Moonshine is white whiskey. Uh, we then take that and bottle it, ship it down here to Key West, or smuggle it into Key West. And you can substitute this whiskey in any tropical drink that has rum in it. Um, so, you know, if you enjoy drinking a rum runner whenever you're in town, uh, instead of getting the uh, the well rum that's going to give you a hangover, you can say, hey, substitute the smuggler's whiskey in there instead, and it mixes into um, fruit drinks, uh, tropical drinks, just like a rum does. Uh, this is the only bourbon whiskey that you could put in pineapple juice, for example, specifically formulated for that. So that was the catalyst that started the company. And then later we'll talk about uh, the different products and things that we have in our line and how that's expanding. Um, so once that came out um, and I moved down here permanently, uh, also started looking into the uh, Hemingway factory. This is a Hemingway town. And when we found out that um, Hemingway drank absinthe, that's when I started looking into absinthe. And that's how we got kicked off on the, um, the, uh, the absinthe rabbit trail. 
and that's really what has expanded the company substantially and, and really built uh, a basis um, for the expansion moving forward. The philosophy of the company, whenever I first started the company, was to spend money locally and use all of the local talent and the local artists here in Key West. Uh, it's a town full and has a rich history of, of art. Um, we didn't want to, you know, print signs and things like that were made in China. We didn't want products, shirts and hats and things like that that were made in China. We wanted everything about the brand to reflect made in the USA, buying local, supporting local artists, that type of thing. So all of our signs uh, are all designed by local artists or um, artists that come to Key West. For example, Pashur, who designed the label of the Death in the Afternoon. Uh, he comes down for Fantasy Fest every year and does Fantasy Fest poster, and he's, and he's, a, he's a body artist. We've employed uh, dozens and dozens of artists around town to create art for us that we use as our bar signage and t-shirt designs and all of those kind of things. Uh, we have a wood shop here on premise, uh, so we operate out of a, a effectively a tin shack in Key West, and I make all of the deliveries on a scooter here in Key West, all of the local deliveries. So we're a very grassroots effort, out on the street, face-to-face, uh, -face meeting people, shaking hands, doing events. Um, we have a wood shop next door where all of our signage, uh, we get our, once we have our design for a sign, we get those printed, and then we make all of our own wood frames out of local hardwoods that have came out of houses that have been torn down or, or rehabbed here in Key West. So typically the frames on our signs are over 100 years old. Uh, so we try to make everything uh, local as we can and if it, we can't do it locally then we at least do a made in the USA so all of our shirts hats swag of any kind everything that we use is all local or made in the USA same as with our products all of the products that I produce use all natural highest quality ingredients we don't skimp on any of the ingredients it was important that the brand not become a novelty and just be something that people enjoyed when they're in Key West, but it didn't taste all that great. So we wanted to make sure that the quality of the product itself was top notch. In the very first year that this product came out, uh, we won, entered three contests uh, of the largest spirits competitions in the world and got medals in all three of those competitions. The only three that we've entered so far and we've medaled in all three, including a silver, at the San Francisco World Spirits Competition in the Genuine Bourbon category, which is the largest spirits competition in the world. So, now that we know where we've been, uh, now we need to know where we're going, which is we're going to be expanding into the New Orleans uh, market and expanding on our uh, uh, Spirits of New Orleans line and the new Absinthe products. Um, since we have been uh, illegal for four of the five generations uh, in the family, uh, when I started the company, uh, the tagline that I came up with was notoriously good for not getting caught. So please join us in the journey as we move forward into the future and try not to get caught. Super excited about where the company has came, how things have developed, the, um, the base, the fan base, and the um, things that we've created, and it's all been organic. There's not been any paid followers. There's not been any paid customers. Uh, everything that we have built is, is solid foundation. Uh, we did the hardest part first, so when I decided to come to Key West and bring a bourbon whiskey to Key West was probably the absolute hardest thing you could do in the alcohol business. Uh, Key West is also one of the most difficult markets to break into from a brand uh, in general, uh, and I specialize in doing things that people say that I can't do. So everything that people tell me, you can't do this, you can't get into this place, you can't get a sign put in here, you can't, all of the things that the no-sayers uh, have said that couldn't be done, I have accomplished these things. Um, and now the future is bright, so the, the next steps moving forward uh, are going to be a much easier uh, step. Um, the plan for the company originally has always been to create the branding, uh, the Key West branding, and create that, uh, that base uh, to build from. And then the natural expansion, especially with the absences into the New Orleans market, uh, which is the spirits of New Orleans, as I said earlier, uh, that's our full you know, absinthe offering and portfolio of absinthe and establish ourselves as the experts. Uh, there's not another company in the New Orleans area that specializes in absinthe. And quite frankly, it's, um, it's a poorly done, um, the, 
the efforts that are going on there as well. <clears throat> it's also very cost effective, uh, a lot more cost effective uh, in New Orleans than it actually is in QS. QS is the third most expensive place in the United States to operate this way. We're here at our headquarters right now, which is, um, like I say, the Tin Shack in Key West, but it's uh, uh, valued away over a million dollars just, just because of the way property works in Key West. And then the third expansion past New Orleans will be uh, moving into Europe, which is the, the Spirits of Amsterdam. So Spirits of Amsterdam will be the third phase of the company, and we'll just carry on um, what we've developed and designed in New Orleans will then carry off into um, into Amsterdam and that'll be our European entrance at that point. So we've got the base company which is the QS trading company and all of our products that are associated with that that we'll continue to expand on. We've got the Spirits of New Orleans which is our other wholesale division in New Orleans that'll specialize in you know, sp specific absence uh, and that building that portfolio and then when we branch off into Europe we'll be taking that same portfolio and then going to Europe with that and that model. So we'll perfect the model in New Orleans and then we'll duplicate that model in Europe. And I feel uh, based on what we've learned so far is that each of these steps will get progressively easier as we go along, as we, we've kind of blazed the trail, we've kind of you know, cut our teeth and made our mistakes and you know, spent money where it didn't need to be spent and determined there's money should be spent in other locations. So uh, I'm very conservative in, in my estimations, you know, moving into the future. Um, also proud of the fact that this company is completely debt free, has remained debt free the entire time. No partners, no investors up to this point. I've built the company grassroots to what I would like to call the mezzanine level. And then from this point moving forward is when, um, at this point, we need some help to kind of just make it move faster. I could organically grow the company without any investments or any any uh, help whatsoever. It would just be a slower pace, uh, but I believe that the brand has gotten to the point and the opportunities are sitting there waiting uh, that it, it doesn't make any sense not to bring on uh, some investment capital to uh, really just launch us into the stratosphere as far as that's concerned from a good solid foundation that has been well established. Thank you for taking the time to watch the video and um, we appreciate uh, any help and support.